that's going to be a thrift store so that we can resell some of the items to help cover our costs. Hi, I'm Nicola Sage, and I'm here with Dave Sampson, who's the chairman of Dignity Village don't. here in Northeast yeah. Portland. Hi, Dave. Well, thanks for coming on out. We'll, uh, I'll give you a tour of the village. Okay. Ready Show you around. There's a shack right there. We have 24-hour security, so we always have somebody at the gate and on duty at all times. That's also where our phone is at. This is where we hold all our council meetings. Um, you know, whenever we have uh, feeds, whenever people come, and like we have lots of different church groups come, and we'll feed us dinner or lunch or stuff like that. So that, that's where we do this. And it's right now. It's in the it's in the midst of uh, being finished off. So the interior, it's basically just a shell right now. Okay. So here we go. Same people reading the same things. Okay. Unless anybody wants to change. All right. Here we go. Take one. Take two. Jeez. We're new to Portland and couldn't find a shelter that would let a man and wife stay together. And the dog was definitely not welcome at any of them. We don't want to be part, and the dog is like our child. At Dignity Village, couples can stay together, and we have lots of pets. Terry's, Terry's Duke. Terry's dog, Duke, is a Katrina survivor. Well, there's five basic rules. The first rule is no violence to yourself or others. No theft. Uh, no drugs or alcohol within a two-block radius of the thing. Um, no constant disrupted behavior. And everybody must contribute at a minimum of 10 hours of uh, sweat equity towards the support of the village. Uh, some people get in here, and within months, they're basically dialed back in with a job and resources, and they get out, and other people take a lot longer. Some of the people have been here in like seven years. You know, so we try to put everybody to work. You know, the people that aren't physically capable of carrying out labor, like picking up a hammer and the other stuff, we, we try to shift them into jobs that, that'll, you know, uh, meet their level of need. You know, yeah. 60 is our peak number, but, but there are only 43 slots. See, there are only 43 of these grids that the city will let us build houses on. So basically, the population, you know, and half that number comes from couples. Now, all of these are waiting to be converted into houses. Eventually, every little tarp structure will look like one of the other type houses. And how that house looks is pretty much depends on the people moving in there. If they want to put the effort into making it neat, cute, and adding little things to it, they can. Otherwise, they just get a basic box. Not a lot of space, but it's efficient, and that's the entry point. That was uh, built by Getty Red Allen for his girlfriend, Laura, and she, he said he would build her a castle, and he did. That's one of the original Cobb straw houses. Mm -hmm. And it's gone through, uh, several people have lived in it, and it's gotten altered all along the way. Um, and it's not fully a cob house now, because one of the walls on the outside was replaced. And oh, okay. So, but they're working on it. And it's pretty neat, and once they get it all finished up. But of course, they don't work as hard on it as I do, what me and Dave do on ours. So that's why <laughs> our house is nice, because we spend a lot of time working on it. This is actually my house right now. We have the biggest one here. It's too big, it's too huge, you got too much room. We're like, no, no, it's just fine. It's, uh, there's no reason why they have to be tiny. And pretty much they're all propane, all the heat, all the cooking comes from propane. The heaters that the fire department donated right there, the little propane wall-mounted things, they're real safe. They got the nice little piezoelectric igniters on them and everything. And uh, in this last year, we got really lucky. We built uh, in the in one year, we put together six structures, and that's a record for the village. And so hopefully this next year, we're going to do the same thing again and get six more of these knocked out and put into buildings so that we can. Because these are really, I mean, they're, they're way better than the alternative of sleeping outside. But for an older person or somebody like a vet or somebody who's got health issues, you get in there and they're never quite dry when it's wet. Mm -hmm. You know, they're hard to keep warm. And, you know, we have some people with health issues that are in there that it's like, it's not really the best environment. I mean, it's way better than sleeping on the streets or in your car or something. But, you know, there's, there are some issues with yeah. making it a little more livable. But we're grateful for everything we get. I mean, people come in and they want to donate couches and sofas and old refrigerators and giant big screen TVs that we don't have the room or the space or the, the will to, to really deal with. You know, it'd be nice to have a big screen TV, but we don't have the electricity, we don't have the space. Yeah. <laughs> what are some of the things that you do need? Well, we constantly need um, like the ceiling materials for the buildings, like Tyvek and siding and, and insulation and those kind of things. 
but we seem to get a fair amount of like two by fours and two by sixes and scrap plywood and stuff like that. Well, this all started because we just did this earlier to do dishes, and then I figured that once we had the fire gun miss, we'll throw a pot of beans on for later. So exactly. Why not kill two birds with one stone? I don't know where my uh, I don't know where my my housemate and fire tender wandered off to. He's fired. Is each person in charge of cooking their own food then? Pretty much most of the time. We do have some community meals. Um, sometimes when the church com groups come in, they'll come in and cook everything and lay it all out. And then other times we'll get things in and sometimes they'll bring just dairy products, other times it'll be produce, sometimes big packages of lunch meat or rolls of turkey or something like that. You know? Stuff like this that's perishable usually comes out and gets distributed immediately. Like, this will all get carried off. Yeah, within a very short amount of time this will all go. People will collect all that and we'll cook for ourselves and we'll just put on a barbecue or something depending upon the you know, the time and the materials that we have to work with. Well, a lot of times, like, we share meals. Yeah. Like, somebody will have a package of meat, somebody else. Uh, generally, kind of hang out in clusters. It takes about $2,000 a month to run this place. And that's just bare minimal, just yeah. making the bills and getting along. You know, and we take care of si up to 60 homeless people like that. You know, and yet we're spending billions and billions elsewhere. You know, and and then the, uh, the government-run attempts to deal with the homeless thing. All that they're doing is they just become expensive bureaucracies and we can't afford to carry them because they don't fulfill the need and they cost way too much money. You know, this is a better model because every single, you know, unlike a lot of uh, charities and nonprofits, every single dollar that comes in here goes into the village. So my goal is to get the village uh, budget up to about five grand. I think if we had about five grand a month, we could not only uh, provide a better quality service here, but we could start doing outreach where we could start uh, making donations to the other shelters or even purchase some land and get more people off the streets. Thank you so much, Dave, for your time and for showing me around this really unique place. It's much appreciated. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. I love showing you around the village. I'm Nicola Sage, bringing you the tools to be sustainable today.